So welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining this ECE Data Science Distinguished webinar. So before uh, presenting our speaker today, let me just briefly go over some logistics. So if you have any questions, you can write them in the Q&A chat box that you see there. Okay. And towards the end of the talk, we're going to select some of those questions to be answered by our speaker today. During the talk, I'll be monitoring this chat box in case there is any pressing issue that makes sense to address in the middle of the talk. Otherwise, most of them will be, um, most of the questions will be answered towards the end of the talk, as I previously mentioned. Okay. So that being said, it is my great pleasure to present today uh, Professor Gunnar Carlson as our distinguished speaker of this data science seminar. So Professor Carlson received his PhD from Stanford back in 1976. Uh, he did the usual tenure track uh, ladder mm -hmm. of assistant to associate to full as a faculty member at UCSD, and then moved to Princeton for around five years until 1991 where he returned to his alma mater, Stanford, as a full professor. So he has given plenary addresses at the annual meetings of the AMS and SIAM, an invited uh, address at the International Congress of Mathematicians, and delivered multiple famous lecture series, like the Radamacher lecture series at, at UPenn, where I did my PhD. So I actually checked, uh, when I checked yesterday, uh, you gave this lecture series on spring 2011, which was just a few months before I joined uh, UPenn in fall 2011. Mm -hmm. so, so I actually missed you there by a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, so then during his first uh, 20 years of career, he worked exclusively in the core areas of algebraic topology, having proven several famous conjectures. And then over the last two decades, he has been applying part of that fundamental knowledge to the study of data under the general umbrella of topological data analysis, of which Professor Carlson has become the worldwide reference. So uh, today's talk will bring actually notions from TDA, from topological data analysis, closer to deep learning, uh, to hot fields, as we all know. Uh, so on a very quick personal note, uh, my first ever conference paper that I wrote back in 2012 and I published in ICAS 2013 was actually co-authored by with Gunnar. So however, the interesting thing is I, I did not meet him in person until this year, 2020, <laughs> eight years after that first manuscript. Where, where I saw him at ITA, and I presented myself as that uh, young student with whom he had collaborated back then, but never met in person. So since, since that point, I, I wanted to bring him to Rice. Of course, given the circumstances, not physically, but I am very happy that he could join us for a distinguished speaker. Uh, so, so with that, uh, thank you, Gunnar, for joining, and the floor is all yours. Okay, very good. Listen, so thank you uh, very much, Santiago, for, uh, for inviting me to do this. I always enjoy going out and talking to seminar in, in seminars and so on, but there hasn't been much opportunity for it in the last few months for obvious reasons. So um, I'm really uh, looking forward to this and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, first of all, I, I suspect I'm, I'm saying things that many people here in the audience already know in these first few slides, but let me bring it up anyway. Um, what is deep learning? It's a methodology based on neural networks or computation graphs, uh, various kinds of directed graphs. Um, it has uh, produced outstanding classification results for many kinds of complex data, including images, text, uh, molecules, time series, uh, on and on. Um, there are some issues, though, that people are, are, are grappling with. Um, so adversarial examples, uh, situations where um, you, you have a database of images, but maybe you modify them a little bit almost imperceptibly to the human eye, but nevertheless uh, it uh, you know really degrades the classification power of the of the method. Uh, the general lack of transparency. I think uh, people uh, don't feel that they understand what's going on in the same way as they do uh, algebraic and, and, and other more traditional methods of modeling. And, and that actually limits usefulness in, in many key domains. Uh, I've certainly run across it in, in, in some regulated industries like the financial industry and, and, and healthcare and so on. Um, and we would like to be able to learn more complex models, perhaps. So um, in any event, yes, neural networks, they're <clears throat> based on one's understanding of how the brain works of the human nervous system. Um, so that's kind of the starting point that I believe, you know, Jeffrey Hinton was one of the, perhaps the uh, starting point for this. Um, so a formal description of neural networks, we're given a directed graph, a state of the directed graph is an assignment of a value, maybe real, maybe Boolean to each vertex. Um, 
coefficient system is an assignment of a value to each edge, a weight. Uh, and for any vertex, we denote uh, the collection of all pairs, uh, W and E, where W is, is a vertex, an edge is, uh, and, and E is an edge uh, terminating in W. Um, and we then have compute an update function based on that, and that involves a choice of an activation function, which is typically a symmetric function of all the inputs. Um, so we can regard it as a, an automaton in a, in a certain sense with the state set being vectors with coordinates, uh, the vertices of gamma. Um, but it can also be regarded as a computational formula, the input variables being the values of the state and the coefficients in the formula, if you like, being the values of the coefficient system. It's not quite accurate, but nevertheless, one can, one can think of it in those terms as, as a generating an extremely complex formula. So there are many different kinds of neural networks um, uh, that, that have been proposed and that have been used. Um, you know, one, of course, is uh, sort of a completed directed graph. Usually uh, one arranges uh, the, the nodes in layers, and so the complete connections go from one layer to the next. Um, but oftentimes that, uh, the, the complete directed graph doesn't, or, or what we call the fully connected network, doesn't really do what you want. Um, so, but there's a large useful class, it's called the feed-forward networks, which are given by this picture here, um, where there's an input layer, and then, as I said before, you have a hidden layers one, hidden layer two, um, and, and the hidden layer, uh, finally an output layer here. And again, these connections here, you'll, you'll notice in everything in the input layer is connected to everything in the hidden layer one, and everything in hidden layer one is connected to everything in hidden layer two. So this is, you know, obviously some kind of improvement and this works uh, in, in, in some circumstances, uh, but it is often useful to sparsify the networks a bit as well and to also introduce some other um, ideas about them. So let me talk about this for a sec. Um, so the final output, yeah, I'm sorry, this is a... So there's a very useful restriction of this, um, uh, the, the con or, or I should say sparsification that, uh, that uh, is useful. So convolutional neural networks, the structure of the network is adapted to specific cases. So in images, each of the layers uh, can be regarded as a, a 2D rectangular array. Text would be 1D arrays and time series might be 1D arrays. If one were dealing with volumetric stuff, one might be dealing with three, um, uh, 3D uh, grids. As the, uh, as the array uh, in each layer. But the key thing is that, so it is a feed forward network, um, but, uh, but this geometry, uh, the grid geometry, that gives the structure of the, of the feature space here, because remember for images, um, uh, each pixel can be regarded as a feature of uh, the data point, which is the full image. And so we actually have a geometry on the feature space here that we know a priori, it's, it comes with the data, and it's this rectangular grid. And so the way that one uses that to sparsify uh, the, the network is to say, actually, I'm not going to connect everything in layer I with everything in layer I plus one. I'm only going to connect it, and here, I'm only going to connect it to pixels that are nearby. So if you look here at the, at the, uh, at the input layer, which is a grid, and then here we have a, a number of copies of uh, identical grids, um, the idea is that I get to connect only uh, each pixel only to things that are closely uh, related to it in that grid geometry. So I don't, for example, have you know, any connection between, the, between a, uh, a pixel in the upper left and the lower right-hand corner. So this is what I would call, call you know, localization or locality. And it's useful, it, the, the, the idea here is that, um, you know, one should be studying, one, one doesn't believe that one has correlations, uh, you know, uh, of, of pixels that are very far removed from each other. One might as particular classes of images and so on, and then one would want to include that. But in general, we kind of believe that, well, images, what one sees in images are sort of detected uh, locally. Now, there's also a notion of pooling here, which says that I might, um, uh, you know, make smaller grids and use an averaging procedure and then connect in that, in that form. So, um, uh, and, th and that is a, a sort of a generic way of producing these convolutional neural networks. So this kind of gives the architecture um, 
and, and, and hang on, let me say, uh, in addition, though, to the architecture, there's an additional condition that's imposed here, and this is, this is critical in the convolutional uh, setting. So uh, what it says is that not only do I insist on locality here, but I also insist that within, if I take a fixed layer, or I should say a fixed grid in the second layer, um, every, uh, every connection there has the same weights. In other words, the weights are the same whether I'm going from a node in the upper left to a node in the upper left or a node in the lower right to the node in the lower right. It's kind of equivariant or convolutional as the term has been said. So that's a further restriction. And what that is doing is that is imposing the idea that you want to be able to say, if I have a cat in the upper left-hand corner uh, and a cat in the lower right-hand corner, I should detect it in exactly the same way. And that's uh, consistent with our notion of vision, how humans see things. And uh, so, and that turns out to be uh, extremely powerful in you know building classifiers for classes of, for databases of images and in many other applications. So, question might be here though: Does does learning by uh, convolutional neural networks behave like human learning? Um, um, so. And, and let's see if we can start to think about how I might want to answer this. Uh, I'll talk about this as this is joint work with my uh, collaborator, uh, Richard Gabrielson. So what do we want to know? Um, okay, um, let, me, let me say the following. So um, in topological data analysis, um, we have studied in the past um, data sets consisting of three by three image patches. Uh, and the geometry of those things um, are, are quite interesting, and they are approximated in low, I should say, in low dimensions, or they're approximated by um, uh, patches that are like Gabor filters, uh, and they are, have the geometry of either a circle, if I do very high density, or um, uh, a Klein bottle, if I relax that threshold a little bit. So what happens is the network learns what are the responsibilities of the various layers. Um, so let me, yeah. What are, and I think this second, this third question is actually quite interesting to me. What are the responsibilities of the various layers? So now here is a summary of that work that I mentioned before about the image patches. So this was an analysis of a data set of three by three patches in natural images. Um, we studied only high variance patches there. So of course, in an image, uh, there are going to be lots of constant patches. Uh, they're easy to understand if you're thinking in terms of compression. You know, they can be expressed by a single number instead of by a, you know, a nine vector if in a three by three patch or, 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 or some bigger patch. So uh, those are not interesting. And so the question becomes only to study the high variance ones. Now, even within those, though, it turns out that there's actually um, a lot of... Um, um, uh, the things that go on in there. So uh, one would want to study only the most frequently occurring motifs, the densest such patches, if you like. So, uh, and we, we're going to be using not uh, some formal uh, density estimator, but just density proxies of varying locality, something we call codensity. And it's motivated by the goal of understanding how the tuning of neurons in the visual cortex was affected by the statistics of natural images. So just to give you a sense of it, the finding was the following. At one, with, for the use of one density estimator, we obtained this primary circle. Uh, so you can see here, this is really moving uh, a, a linear gradient, a discretized version of it, but rotated by an angle theta that describes the circle. So this is really pretty easy to, uh, uh, to believe. This is kind of linear approximation in the first, uh, the first order. Um, but what we found was that when we used um, a different density estimator, a more local, more refined density estimator, that in fact, the data broke up into, into uh, pieces. So we call it uh, three circles. So here in the middle is this primary circle, which is the one that we saw before. So you can see here again, they're rotating. But there's also two secondary circles that we found. Um, and uh, you can see here that what those are, those are in vertical and horizontal directions, and they are moving from a linear gradient to something that might look more like a quadratic thing here. And so there's an intermediate passage from that going around this circle. And so I see it in two uh, different directions, the vertical and the horizontal, 
And what you can see here is that this, uh, this green patch is the same as that one. This green patch is the same as that one. And similarly here, uh, this one is the same as that one. And, and, and this is identified with this. We discovered this by performing so-called persistent homology calculations, which is something that I'll sort of show you a little bit later. But that sort of gave a very strong signal for the presence of these three circles. Um, now, ultimately, we moved beyond that, moved beyond the, the three-circle model, and asked what happens if I permit, uh, uh, you know, patches that are not vert just vertical or horizontal. In other words, these secondary circles that might go in other angles. And so we find that with a with a more relaxed density thresholding, you actually get uh, a Klein bottle here, a description of a mathematical object called the Klein bottle. And what that is, that's a, an object which is a rectangle, um, but you've made identification. So this point here on the left is identified with this point down here in the lower right. And here is identified with here. So what you're doing is you're performing the sort of uh, identifications that you might do uh, when you're making a Mobius band. But additionally, you make these further identifications, this one with this one, this with this, and so on. And uh, that's not something that you can actually accomplish with paper. You will tear the paper if you do that because this bottle does not um, fit inside three-dimensional space. It won't embed inside three-dimensional space. Uh, okay, so uh, the primary visual cortex is the lowest level processing beyond the retina. There are higher levels, uh, but it is known that there are individual neurons that detect the edges and lines. So this is consistent then with the idea of compression of frequent signals. And again, here, the, the, obviously, the visual pathway is quite complicated. This is really capturing just the first order of it, the V1, so to speak. And there are much more complicated features happening at the higher abstraction level. So one question we're going to try to understand is, can we see some of that abstraction at the higher levels happening as I study neural networks? OK, so let me now uh, talk a bit about the topological data analysis before I launch into that. Because so, um, so um, the idea here is that, that, that um, models, uh, algebraic models, uh, formal algebraic models, are often not ideal for studying uh, complex data. So, um, so the question is, what is it? Uh, what the data has shape and the shape matters. Um, and so let's think about what we mean by modeling. Um, so let's look here at the shape of this data that we're seeing here. One thing that, that pops out at, at us is it looks like it fits along a line. Uh, and so this can be accomplished by linear regression. This is actually something that's quite uh, uh, excellent, obviously, when it can be done. So when the data actually fits along a line, that's absolutely what you want to do. Um, but on the other hand, you might be confronted with data that looks like this. Uh, which is, uh, you know, it, it, it's got a characteristic structure to it. It breaks up into three pieces. And so, in fact, it can be modeled by a shape just in the same way as that earlier data was modeled by a line, which is a shape. So this data is modeled by three discrete points. You might not think of that as a uh, shape, but uh, it, it certainly is. And so clustering, which is another, you know, large field in statistics and, and, and mathematics, um, uh, is also an approximation by shape. It's just that it's a different shape. And we might hope that we're done here, but we'd be confronted with data that looks like this, kind of loopy data, um, occurs with time series and periodic or recurrent behavior. And here I would approximate it by a circle or maybe an ellipse and so on. And, and so I, I might say, well, just like we built clustering and regression, maybe I should build a loop detector. Um, and I could do that. Um, on the other hand, I'd worry a little bit uh, that, well, when I do, once I do that, I'm not going to be done. And of course, I won't be done because something like this might come up uh, where, you know, we have uh, a central uh, area of, uh, you know, very consistent uh, uh, normal behaviors and then three extremal behaviors. So, for example, we might have an airplane um, you know, flying at altitude in non-turbulent conditions might be the normal modes, and then uh, landing, takeoff, uh, and flying in turbulent conditions might be the three extremes. So what this argues for now is saying, actually, I don't want to have to fix the shape that I'm going to approximate with beforehand. Maybe I need to build a modeling mechanism that can actually capture all shapes all at once. Now, the output is going to be have, to have to be something different here. It's not going to be algebraic equations. So let me recall for you, or let me tell you about, um, 
um, uh, Leonard Euler's work. So this was the beginning of the area of topology, which is the study of shape. Um, uh, and uh, he was actually uh, having to do a recreational mathematics problem, uh, which was to ask the question, can you cross all the seven bridges across the River Pregel in Königsberg, can you cross them all without crossing any bridge twice? And you know, the, the information, of course, was kind of, had a lot of detail to it that was irrelevant. You know, how deep is the river? How wide is the river? How big is the island? How long are the bridges? And so forth. Um, all those things were irrelevant, and all that mattered was the simplified structure on the left, which is this network. And from there, he was able to quite uh, you know, readily solve the problem, reason about the problem. Uh, so let me show you now a, a way of uh, doing the same thing, but for, uh, for uh, data sets in general. So I'm going to suppose that I have a data set, and I've given you, I'm showing you a very simple one here. This is not, of course, the thing that we usually apply it to. Uh, and we have a projection out to the real line. Now, here it's the y-coordinate function. But in general, it's going to be something more statistically meaningful. It might be uh, measures of density. Uh, and, and I should say I can have more than one projection here and make the construction. It might, um, it might also include measures of centrality. It might also be uh, you, you know, uh, machine learning things like, mach uh, like PCA1 and PCA2 or, or MDS1 and MDS2. Um, <clears throat> so in any event, one takes this projection or co collection of projections and then bin the data uh, into overlapping bins by choosing an overlap a covering uh, of overlapping sets on the interval. So at this point now I've been the data and you can see on the left there that um, I have the, the orange pieces in that upper uh, uh, bin are identical with the orange pieces in the, in the, in the lower right bin. Um, and and um, sorry, not the lower, the, the next bin below. And so the next step then is to say, once I've been it like this, now I can apply a clustering step uh, and produce a, a node for every cluster. So what you can see here is this, uh, this cluster over here corresponds to this node, this cluster to this node, and this cluster to this node. Now you might say, well, so this is kind of a soft clustering in the sense that the clusters can overlap. Uh, that's an opportunity for us because it allows us to say, actually, we can retain some of the geometry because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect any two nodes uh, which, uh, have, uh, which correspond to clusters which overlap. So, for example, this cluster and this, this node and this node are connected because uh, this cluster is, is overlapping with this cluster. So here, and you can see we've recovered the full circle and it's, uh, it's, it's remarkably useful uh, this uh, this method. Um, of course, it doesn't always work as perfectly as this, and we don't actually, you know, recover this space with precision. Um, so, uh, question is: So, what what do we mean by topological modeling? Then, I want to say that instead of the output being equations or differential equations or partitions in the case of clusters, it's a network uh, or a simplicial complex, if you like that term, or or graphs. It's not just a visualization, but there are actually many capabilities to it. So for example, one can um, you know, build software that puts the, the, the graph on the screen and now allows you to select the way of you would in Photoshop or Illustrator. Uh, and that's a great way to interact with the data. It also gives maybe natural ways to segment the data into pieces that one could use. Um, coloring and hotspot analysis, if I have a quantity of interest like survival or revenue or something like that, I can often color by that and see that I have hotspots in that regard. And also explain and justify, because I can take segments in, in, the, in the graph, take the corresponding uh, uh, data points, and ask what are the features that best explain those? In other words, for whom um, the, the distributions are the most removed from uh, you, you know, the normal, uh, normal distribution. So um, topological feature creation and selection is something one can also do and also model assessment and improvement. But let me show you now. Um, so uh, let's go to the topological analysis of weight spaces. So what I'm showing you here now, so this, let me, this is now the study of a convolutional neural net uh, that has been trained on MNIST. MNIST is sort of the simplest data set of uh, digits, hand-drawn digits. Um, and what you can see here is that, um, well, and I should say, what we are doing is we're taking, we're creating a data set from it. And the way that we're doing that is we're taking each node in a layer 
and we are saying, let's take all the weights that come into it. So if we have a, if we have a situation where we're connecting each point only to its, you know, it, its box around it, the three by three box, there are nine uh, elements coming in. So, and in the neural network, we have created the weights there. And so we have a nine vector, just like we would have a nine vector if we were looking at natural images. And so that's what this is, uh, that's what this is doing. This is studying that data set of weights that gets computed after multiple iterations of uh, studying this, uh, of training this data set. And so again, we carried out the same analysis that we did in the case of uh, the image patches. And so what you see here is that the high density points, the high variance, high density weight arrays are, look very much like the ones that, that, um, that came out of that statistical analysis. In particular, the mapper model. So that descri description I showed you, that construction is called mapper. And what you can see here is that it produces actually a very nice circle. Now, you might say to me, uh, I, I would like to have some better way of characterizing that rather than just you giving me this network because you know maybe I adjusted the network somehow, maybe I fiddled with it. So I, I would like to have some way of saying, look, there is a loop in the data that is uh, you know more, less biased or, you know, or, or, or that is a sort of an unsupervised way of recognizing that there is a loop in there. And that's called persistent homology. So what you can see here is persistent homology produces outputs that are so-called barcodes. And what, what a dimension zero barcode shows is here, that's, it's, it's, it's a single thing, which means that there's a single connected component. That's the dimension zero analysis. Um, and then a dimension one analysis, uh, a long bar indicates the presence of a loop. Uh, and, and here, this bar is quite strong. So uh, we've kind of verified the existence of this kind of primary, what we call the primary circle before, in this uh, uh, weight vector data set. Uh, both in terms of showing it in terms of the mapper model, but also in terms of uh, the persistent homology. So I'm going to show you a few other things here that, that come out of this. So here, this is also MNIST, but this is a more localized density measure. The question was initially, are we going to find uh, the secondary circles? Well, the initial cut, we don't uh, quite. You know, it looks a little confusing here. I think it looks like this kind of primary circle behavior going on, but there's stuff filling in in the middle. Um, so I'm going to be showing you other situations where it comes up uh, better. So this is uh, another data set called CIFAR-10, uh, where here uh, the weight, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the weight vectors that come out are actually quite complex. Uh, these look like something that belong at, in the more abstract levels. Uh, and uh, of, the, of the visual process. You can see here there's kind of what I would call bullseyes and crossings and so on. So this too is interesting to see what's there with, with high density, uh, but it's not very conclusive. But for CIFAR-10 now, when we reduce it to grayscale and we look in the, in the second layer, we're seeing something that actually looks much more like the primary circle. So here you can see all these uh, weight vectors out here are kind of the, the, the interesting things. They, they, they belong to the primary circle or are close to them, or closely approximated by them, but they still retains some of this behavior in the middle, which is capturing bullseyes. Uh, and here, uh, we, again, persistent homology does show the presence of, of the loop. Now, so here, this is also CIFAR-10, and this, uh, I, I, is 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 to my mind uh, very uh, interesting. So this is uh, this is showing the first and the second layers, and what we're doing is we're studying the behavior of, of these things as I iterate. Uh, so in other words, as I'm doing the deep learning, uh, there's a whole optimization procedure that goes in, and I train on a certain amount of data, and I perform my optimizations, and then I train on more and perform more optimizations, and so forth. And so what you'll notice is here now. In this case, the mapper model is just uh, is a squared grid initially here, and it looks kind of random. Um, but what you see then is as I start training, I start filling in the primary circle a little bit. I've got some red here. So um, to be clear, you know, here the model isn't yet showing the circle. It does that the next stage over. But what it is showing is that I'm getting many more points here. The coloring here is by the number of points in a node. And so you can see is there's a lot of points that are concentrating around the boundary. 
And that increases over time here so that now here I'm seeing an honest to God circle. But now what starts to happen, oddly, is that this fills in, starts to fill in a little bit. Um, and in fact, now some heavily dense stuff is, is actually filling in in the middle and I'm losing the, sum, the primary circle behavior. It's actually degrading a little bit. And then it degrades even further here and gets to this point over here where I'm capturing, um, you know, yes, the four corner points, but I'm capturing this stuff in the middle, which is, uh, turns out to be uh, looking like these bullseyes here. But look at what's happening in the second layer. In the second layer, nothing is happening here, nothing much for the first few iterations. It's not really doing much. But then as, as that uh, circle, as the primary circle starts to degrade up here, one starts to notice something forming here, you know, some, some compensation here uh, about the primary circle. And by the time I get out to 2000 iterations, now I have a fully developed primary circle here. So it's an interesting thing. It's kind of the reverse of what you might have expected, which is that in this case for CIFAR 10, um, the, um, the first layer initially got to the, to the primary circle, but then got to capturing some higher level stuff and the second one kind of compensated for it. You know, this is a, a empirical finding. We find it interesting. We don't have full, complete explanations for it, obviously. Um, so uh, now this is, of course, a density thresholding. So here it was a situation in CIFAR 10 where we did see this primary circle, but now we modified the, uh, the, uh, the uh, density estimator a bit, did looser density thresholding. And now we started to see uh, the actual secondary uh, circles. So here you can see the persistent homology actually has five bars in it. Five bars is what's characteristic of the three circle model that I talked about. Um, and here again, it's connected. And you can see that the mapper model here also seems to show that those circles are appearing. So all this stuff depends a bit on, on choosing which density estimators do you choose and so on. So again, we're, we're in the process of exploring this. Um, so let's see. And uh, and here's this, yeah, here's the second layer again. Now, I asked the question before, um, could we say something about the responsibilities of the various, of the various layers? And so here is an analysis that's done on VGG16, which is, uh, you know, a very deep neural network, 16 layer neural network. Uh, that is trained on ImageNet, which is a large database of images with many, many classes in it. Um, and so this is training it. Uh, so this is a pre-trained network. And here we can see what, how, the, how the weight vectors work. And what you can see here is that now here, it really does look much more like what I would expect. Well, initially one sees the primary circle only. And then at the third layer, one starts to see uh, maybe secondary things happening. And now at layer five, something more complicated is occurring with high, high density um, and so forth. So what one, is, one can get some sense here, and this is sort of a uh, qualitative sense, but a qualitative sense that, that indeed uh, it has you know, recapitulated the kind of learning or understanding that would go on within uh, the, the human system or the, the, the mammalian system where one sees the higher abstraction things at the, at the higher levels. So now, so again, I, I think that this kind of analysis, you know, we, we're going to be doing more of it to understand it in more detail, getting it more and more precise and so on. But what I hope that I, I've done with this is to give you some demonstration that what the topological data analysis can allow you to do is to get inside the structure and the weights, um, you know, of the, uh, that, that occur in the neural network so as to start to understand uh, its structure. Okay. Now, so in this initial study, we also did some work where we, we hard-coded the primary circle and the Klein bottle in there. We, and, and, and I'm going to show you some stuff that is going to be even better about this, but the, in this initial study, we found that we speeded up the learning quite a bit more so for a more complex data set called SVHN uh, by hard coding the primary circle in there. In other words, feeding it the primary circle features so that the network doesn't have to learn them. And it allowed us to generalize, uh, to say train on one data set and go to the other one. Nothing spectacular, 
But um, you know, if I try to take MNIST and uh, train it, and then evaluate on SVHN, which is this house number, is much more complicated data set, then um, we were able, we, we, with ordinary neural nets, you get 10% accuracy and a 10% classification problem there. So you, you get uh, nowhere. Uh, but uh, in this case, we moved it up to 22%, not, not great, and we will have done better with some methods that I'm about to describe for you. So TDA and deep architectures. So convolutional grids use the grid structure on the set of pixels in, in a critical way, right? They use it for both for locality, but then also kind of the symmetry of it, the fact that, the that, that you, you, you want your features to have a translational invariance. So the, this a priori geometry is used in designing the neural net. So, uh, it, and, and what it does is it allows you to restrict the class of formulas that you consider. it. And then you restrict the formulas that are local in the geometry of the feature space, but also that have this invariance uh, property. Um, so, um, but what if there isn't an a priori geometry? Uh, what if, you know, what if I, I don't come with, an, with um, having decided that there's a geometry on the feature space? So, well, um, there's, there are discovered geometries. And in fact, uh, we've got feature sets that, that carry the geometry now. So when I take, say, the primary circle and take those patches, there's actually a continuous version of those. Uh, and they're, they're very algebraically well-defined so that each point on that primary circle, or in fact, each point on that Klein bottle, gives you a feature on the image. So that there's actually a geometry on that feature space, which is that of, the, uh, of a circle or a Klein bottle. And so the question is, can one use this geometry to design architectures? And so uh, the answer is that, yeah, we, 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 we're going to do some of that. So let me say we need a formalism. Um, but before getting to the formalism here, I want to explain to you about what I would call feature space modeling. So what I've shown you, the models that I've shown you, of topological, uh, the topological models of the data sets have been uh, models of the set of rows for a data matrix. <clears throat> but it turns out that it's also useful to consider the transpose matrix and consider its rows. So this is actually the set of features in your data set. So, um, uh, so when there are many features, it's actually quite useful to create mapper models of that uh, feature space, not of the row space. And what that does is it compresses and recognizes correlations among the features, but also each row of the original matrix gives a function on this feature set and it turns out, therefore, on the nodes of the topological model. So let me show you how this plays out. So here was one of the analyses that we did, uh, you know, some time ago um, on breast cancer. And this is an analysis of the rows. This is a uh, the so-called NKI data set. It's 272 patients, um, 1,500 genes, uh, expression RNA messenger uh, messenger RNA expression levels. And so the model has this characteristic Y shape to it. And you can see here that when divided into cohorts, this is kind of near normal. This is a cohort with very bad prognosis here, uh, cohort B. This one down here, this cohort right here, actually has perfect survival. And it's about 8% of the patients. And we found out how, how to characterize it and so on. But the, the question now could be, well, what could I, what procedures, what protocols could I build so that I can now try to study why this is happening, you know, what separates the cohorts. And so what, I, what we did is we built a model for the feature space. So in this case, this is a model for a subset of those 1500 genes. So, uh, so there's, the, notice it's the same topological model for all of them, but I'm coloring by the different cohorts. So each cohort is a collection of functions. And so I take the average value of that. Remember the data points, the rows, the patients, if you like, are the samples create functions on the, uh, this topological model of the feature space. So uh, cohort A, you'll notice it's very characteristic. It's, 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 it's light blue or dark blue down here and red up here. Cohort B looks exactly the opposite. It's red down here and blue up here, except there's this collection of genes here that seems not to change no matter what you do. Uh, and then over here, this is now cohort C and Cohort C, one, in looking at that original Y-shaped picture, one could, uh, one could imagine that, well, maybe this is some mix between cohort A and cohort B, but when you look at it like this, what you see is that it really looks much more like a weaker version of cohort B rather than 
uh, like cohort A. You'll notice it's, it's blue up here. It's just slightly smaller blue region. Um, and here's a second uh, analysis along these lines, which is um, <clears throat> uh, done on, so gut biome data from uh, the Larry Smarr group at UC San Diego. So here, right here are the healthy people. This is the feature space again. The feature space in this case consists of abundances of various bacterial populations. Um, and so here, here's the feature space. You see copies of it. Um, over here on the right and lower right is the, uh, the same feature space, but now uh, corresponding to the ulcerative colitis group. And so it's colored differently, but you see it looks quite a bit the same. There's this red here that are the same red here. It's bluish here, bluish here, but there's a bright red area right here in the uh, ulcerative colitis group that has no counterpart in the uh, healthy group. So, um, and, and, and in the same way, if I look up here at, at Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease also looks like the healthy group in many ways, except it's missing this very bright red group up here. So it just gives you a very quick way of understanding and getting inside potentially very high dimensional data, uh, I can sort of operate on it in a much uh, simpler and more intuitive way than trying to do very big uh, matrix calculations on it. So the generalized convolutional neural nets, then how can I use geometry on feature space to build convolutional uh, neural nets? Well, um, you know, feed forward structure, the abstract I can think of it as just a collection of layers there, X naught through Xn, and then correspondences or relations between them. And I would just connect every, anything in X0 to everything in X1, so that which lies in that relation. So, um, or correspondence. So that creates for you a, a sort of a feed forward network. Uh, if I was in the case of the convolutional neural nets, those X's would all be grids, and the, the relation or the correspondence would be the thing that says, well, two things are in the correspondence if their distance in the, uh, you know, the L, L0 distance, I guess it is, is uh, less than less than one, less than or equal to one. So it's a formal way to build, to, to determine, to describe all these connections. Um, so for example, complete correspondences build fully connected feed forward networks. Um, Functional correspondences would be graphs of functions. So if I have a function from X naught to X one, or a function from X i to X i plus one, I would connect each node to the value of the function. Uh, products and compositions of correspondences and pooling correspondences. Um, so here's a pooling correspondence. Pretty easy strategy. But now the interesting thing though is metric and graph correspondences. So for any metric space X and threshold R, uh, there's a metric space correspondence from X to X with where V and W is a member if and only if the distance is less than or equal to R. So the convolutional neural nets are an example of that because again, it, the connections are determined by the, the values of the, uh, the L naught distance. Um, so, and similarly for any graph, I have a graph correspondence from the vertex set to itself where V and W is in the correspondence if and only if VW is an edge. And so, the way you would picture this, for example, is discretized circles and, and ultimately Klein bottles. Um, and, and you can see here that what you would make is you would make only local connections. You would make connections that go from one point to its nearby neighbors on the circle. And finally, mapper correspondences also. So in situations where I don't have a science experiment that I've done, so let me say, in this situation back here, we've done a science experiment now, the, the thing that I showed you, that says that well, it's reasonable to put a, a circular or a Klein bottle geometry on the feature space in, in the context of images, natural images. Um, but there are other situations where maybe I don't understand the feature space and I don't have the time or the inclination to do a detailed study of it. Uh, nevertheless, I can build the mapper models uh, on the feature space and get correspondences that way. Um, so when, so when you've discovered a model um, uh, for the feature space, such as this primary circle or Klein bottle, we can use discretized version as a finite metric space. So we're going to create uh, metric correspondences, perhaps with products with complete correspondences. So the idea is that often in the case of neural nets, in convolutional neural nets, the second layer one wants to build multiple copies of the grid. 
And the way that one would copy would do that here is you would take a product with a relatively small complete correspondence because the product of a discrete set with a graph is a disjoint union of copies of that graph. And um, you know, so if we start with a primary circle and restrict in this fashion, we should encourage learning second order information in the Klein bottle. Okay. So, so uh, this is sort of the ma mapper architecture. Okay, so what I want to talk about uh, to finish up now is um, experiments with, uh, with topological neural nets. So this is joint work with Effie Love and uh, Vasilis Maroulas at University of Tennessee. And so let me talk a little bit about this. So one of the problems that I mentioned with neural networks, uh, in convolutional neural networks, is they often don't generalize well. As I think I pointed out before, if I train on a simple image data set, like MNIST and try to generalize to a more complex one like SVHN, ordinary convolutional methods don't do very well at all. Um, so our hypothesis was uh, that let's try to understand can building these uh, neural nets based on the Klein bottle. So uh, the, the, the geometry of the feature space is actually the Klein bottle will cross a grid because of course you have a Klein bottle feature at every grid point. Um, and would, will, will the fact that we are kind of insisting on keeping the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Klein bottle structure in there, will that help us to generalize? And we've kind of found that in, in a number of different ways. So let me describe the experiment here. Um, so an initial thing that we did was to say, take MNIST, the simple data set, but now um, damage it um, by adding a lot, some pretty substantial Gaussian noise to it. And then let's ask, can we train on the one and get to the other one? And so what you can see happens here is uh, on the left here, I have, I'm training on the noisy MNIST data set. That's the damaged data set. Um, and the, so the accuracy, as you see for the, all these colored things, except for the blue one, they all are, you know, are, are you know, get to a reasonably good point. The blue one is sort of a standard uh, convolutional neural network, and it does not do very well on this. Whereas, uh, the, for example, the Klein bottle um, plus the Klein bottle architectures here, the orange one, um, the orange line, uh, in fact, the orange and green are the two Klein bottle ones. Let me see if I, yeah, here we go. Uh, the orange and green are the two Klein bottle ones. The ones that use only the circle, what's interesting is, You'll notice they get there more slowly. Uh, they eventually get there. And in fact, they actually get to the same point here, but much later. And now here, we're probably seeing kind of standard kind of overfitting things that sometimes happen uh, in the, combo, the, the, the Klein bottle ones. So the Klein bottle ones are the green and the orange, and the purple and the red are the uh, circular features. So that's training on noisy MNIST and evaluating on um, on the, the clean uh, MNIST. Now on the other one here where uh, noisy MNIST is the test set, you know, you have the same kind of behavior. Again, the Klein bottle things work rather dramatically, get you very, very high up. And then you, you, know, you do get some overfitting over time. The circular ones move up uh, more quickly, uh, less quickly. And then finally the blue one hangs out down around here. Um, <clears throat> okay. now. We also analyzed the possibility of generalizing from MNIST to SVHN and SVHN to MNIST, which is something that we studied before. I gave you uh, some small numbers around that when I talked about the initial study that we had done uh, where we just hard coded those features in there. Now, the thing is, SVHN is a much more complex data set. And, and so, um, so one would expect to have difficulty moving from MNIST to SVHN. And indeed, there is a lot of difficulty here. But what we did, we managed to improve over our numbers from before, which were 22%. Here we got up, upwards of, uh, you know, well over 30, ultimately, um, uh, generalized generalization from MNIST to SVHN. And we got actually here over 60% that's cut off here, but in the SVHN to MNIST generalizability. Um, uh, you, you know, so in other words, training on the very complicated data set, SVHN, and evaluating on the simpler one, uh, the MNIST. Um, so, uh, you know, 
of course, neither of these things are any sort of conclusive answer to the to the problem. But what I think what it does say is that you get some you know you, you get a, some in, substantial improvement from using what is a rather simple conceptual idea here uh, of you know building in these features and using the architectures. And here's similar uh, things for generalization, Kaggle to CIFAR. Uh, this was a Kaggle data set, and I, I'm actually I won't, I'm not certain what the nature of that data set was. But anyway, you see the same kind of behavior, although not quite as dramatic. Now, what also we, we also found though was, and this is something that you would expect, is that the learning rate or the amount of data needed to learn once I have in, have imposed the um, you know, the architecture based on these structures and also just simply giving those features, um, you should give some improvement in the amount of data that's needed to learn. And, and indeed that's the case, as you can see here. Well, for MNIST, it's not so dramatic. Maybe MNIST is actually a very simple data set. Although uh, what I would say here is here's the Klein bottle set here. It's, it's, it gets to a, to a point very, very quickly. Same thing happens down here with the US Postal Service. You can see that the two, um, the, 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 the red and the purple ones do quite well. Now, in terms of, um, and, and so here's the standard neural network, here's the blue one. And uh, then this is actually kind of below here. That's a little complicated to understand. I think it has to do with the fact that this is such a simple data set that the Klein bottle itself kind of gets in the way because this can be handled purely with the circle. Um, and then here's SVHN and here it's actually quite, the, the, you know, the, the, the improvement in the learning is quite uh, dramatic. Uh, and here I mean improvement in terms of time and the, the obviously related notion of how much data that one uses. So that's where I, I, I want to stop here. I'm, I, I want to thank you for your attention and I uh, you look forward to uh, your questions and also meetings this afternoon. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Yes, so we actually have some time for questions. So please uh, write the questions in the Q&A chat uh, while you are writing this or thinking all that. So let me, uh, let me kick off this one. Uh, yeah. We'll be talking also later, so I can ask you more there, but let me sure. just start. Uh, so, so just uh, like a few, um, like uh, some easy ones. So like uh, this story, right, for this, uh, let's say three by three kernel that you start talking about, right? So yes. this uh, one, one immediate question would be, I'm guessing that you guys tried this in like a five by five kernel or something. Are, are the observations the same or it become too complicated to analyze? No, no, no. The observations are exactly the same, five by five, seven by seven. Um, um, what does change though is the density thresholds. So, you, you know, the thresholds that you need to find the circle or the, or the three circle model um, are much tighter when I get up to five by five or seven by seven, as one might expect, because there's more flexibility there. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, so here we have a question. Uh, what do you think of this line of work on tropical geometry of deep networks? That's the question. <laughs> Actually, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that, but as, you, but as I hear the word, it sounds like it's extremely sensible given the activation functions that are chosen for the deep neural networks are often have this tropical character to them or belong to the tropical subring. So uh, I, I'm actually a big, I, I like tropical geometry a lot. We've kind of studied it for barcodes uh, where, we, where we found that, you know, uh, algebraic geometry is one way to go with them, but it's not continuous with respect to the favorite metric <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the barcodes, which is the, uh, the bottleneck distance. Whereas if I build tropical things, then I get something there. So, so yes, there, uh, I, I, I actually think it's, that's a quite an interesting observation and that it should be built into this analysis. Awesome, thank you. Here we have another one coming in. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Have you tried your methods on top of data, on top of data augmentation? And maybe a follow-up question where you can capture both. Uh, is that uh, uh, if there is any potential connection between topological neural nets and data augmentation? Yeah. So let's so say data can, augmentation. Can, yeah. Perhaps we can clarify what's meant. I mean, uh, data augmentation means adding new features as to study causality. When you say data augmentation, what does it's that mean exactly? Pro uh, so probably here they are referring, I mean, uh, to 
you know, when, for example, in, in images, you know, you, augment, you might augment data by looking at the mirror image, by cropping, by... Oh, that, yes, yes, yes. Oh, of course. Oh, right, right, right. And I understand. Oh, yeah, no. So actually, we, we had to do some of that early on because... Um, so, so, for example, an interesting question might be, does this the, the density function that one gets on the Klein bottle or on the primary circle is definitely not uniform. You know, the, on the circle, one sees, um, you, you know, that there's... Uh, much more density around the, the, the 90 degree angles, the, the north, south, east, and west. Um, and so in that case, you know, to try to understand what one gets, one could do data augmentation by performing some kind of rotation of those images. And that um, actually, I think, I think that kind of experimentation is something that one really wants to do. And it's something that one is trying to accomplish by imposing these uh, uh, symmetry features and the convolutional neural net. So, one thing I would point out, and I think I've neglected to mention this, is that in the case of the topological neural nets for the circle, just like one has the translations in the convolutional setting, so one has the rotational symmetry on the circle. And that, uh, you know, imposing that says that, actually, I want to be able to recognize something if it's in its rotated state or not. So, um, yes, uh, I, I, I think, as I say, we've done some of that, and I think that's, those are very interesting experiments to do. Awesome. We still have time, so uh, I'll keep, I'll keep uh, bombarding sure. you with these ones. Uh, so are there new deep nets that you can envision based on the interesting no geometric structures? That is, deep nets that have not been conceived of yet. Yes, I absolutely think so. I think one place that's very rich from that point of view I, sh should be text, ultimately. I, I kind of believe that the, that the, that, that the text feature space um, probably has more structure than we've used so far. So, you know, at the moment, there are a lot of these uh, embeddings that, that occur, like word to vec and so on. And, and they have some very interesting properties. Uh, so with word to vec, um, you know, you can have the word king and queen and the word man and woman. And you would find that the vector, you know, king minus man uh, and queen minus woman are actually pretty close. You know, they're lined up, so it's kind of rectangular. On the other hand, words have the property that, um, you know, there, there's a notion of abstraction uh, that one can capture by going into a thesaurus, for example. And, and, and so uh, some people have posited that, well, tree-like structures are important on the feature space for words. Um, and uh, in fact, some people have said then, taking the further step of saying, therefore, we should consider hyperbolic space as uh, a good target for the coordinatizations because trees fit very nicely in, in hyperbolic space. What I would say is that the finding then from the word to vec, this uh, additive property, um, is, um, uh, is evidence for the fact that one should be considering maybe products of trees. Because you don't get squares like that in trees, individual trees, but you do in products of trees. So again, I, I'm here, I'm, this is wild speculation, but you know, maybe, I, I, maybe I'm allowed to do wild speculation uh, in, in answering questions. Yes, yes, I'm, I, yeah, and actually I'm sure that uh, Rich is actually very interested in, in, in these kind of things for words specifically, for text specifically, so that's okay, great. Much point. Uh, so we have another one, how would you relate uh, topological analysis of features to dimension reduction, if any? Oh, absolutely, I know, so this is, from my point of view, that is the key, that is the, that is the thing that one absolutely wants to do with it, so I can just, I can imagine any number of circumstances, any number of things that I could do. So for example, if I build a topological model for the feature space, and I've got 10,000 features, and I find that the topological model looks like a disk, well, I can just take, uh, you know, a set of landmarks in there, a small set of landmarks, and expect to do well. Um, but also, for example, in, 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 in the picture that we saw for the breast cancer, well, I should simply take Maybe if I looked at those, the, the blue and the red areas, I should take the average of all the functions that are, of all the features that occur in those blue areas and the average of all the ones that occurred in the red areas and see that those are functions that probably distinguish well between, you know, surviving and, uh, and, 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 uh, and not surviving or being in a good group or being in a bad group. So actually, I think that there's a lot to be done there. Uh, yeah. I, there's a whole, in fact, there's a whole notion that, that you guys are probably more familiar with than I am, but wavelets on graphs. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I mean, I think it, 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 it's not quite as pretty a theory as the whole, as the big wavelet, you know, the honest to God initial wavelet theory. But nevertheless, it does give you a way of filtering uh, your feature space uh, by the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian and so on. So um, I think there too, it, it can go beyond just dimensionality reduction, but also toward a better understanding of the feature space, you know, which things are relevant and which things are not. Yes, that's an amazing point. Yeah. So, but even, yeah, even in the dimensionality reduction, some, some sort of coarsening while keeping homology, right? So graph coarsening while keeping homology or something because people, yeah, That's right. people a lot of times maybe just focus on graph coarsening from a spectral point of view, uh, but, but yeah, keeping homology while coarsening, uh, that could be quite, actually quite interesting. Yeah, yes. Uh, so uh, another question uh, actually goes very much in this line. So if you have any other comments on that, so could your topological approach be the right way to approach graph neural networks? So I guess it's related to what you just mentioned, but any other thoughts? Yeah, so yeah, I, I think it might be actually, I think when, we, uh, if I understand, my understanding of graph neural networks is those are neural networks that are designed to study properties of graphs. I mean, where the data is actually in graph form. Um, is, is that, at least so that's they, one. They, they can referring to the yeah to the case where you know a feature graph up, so you you run the neural network on the graph structure so like uh, like a graph neural network with a grid would be your image but you have some more irregular grid like uh, or relation wise yeah. right right um, yeah I would say I, I think that's an interesting an interesting uh, thing to try to do and I think the key thing is to try to I mean, you can build a lot of features on graphs. Uh, the key thing is to find the interesting ones and maybe the relations among them. And so ultimately, yes, there could be some topology there. Have not thought that through very hard, but. Um. Mm -hmm. So uh, so let's see, I know we're eating in, into your uh, break here, but uh, uh, so I have just one more and we can continue discussing uh, during the individual meetings, but um, Let's see what we're gonna have. Yeah, so here, for example, this idea of, of uh, dropout that is, you know, uh, seems to be quite successful in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you run this thing and you just drop some neurons or some connections, you know, yeah. randomly. Yes. Uh, could this be uh, pointing at the fact, like in this, for example, circle, right? So maybe the circle, there is some density and stuff, but if you drop some nodes in there, you might be you see the circle more clearly than maybe if you have all the notes in there if you I, drop I think it might be uh, so yes and in fact a general question well you know trying to look empirically for good sparsifications for example is something that right. you're talking about and uh, yeah i totally believe that's a good thing to do uh, but what i also set, think is i think it's also very important from the point of view of trying to compress models trying to make them more understandable to also do things that that are not necessarily so that don't necessarily come out so obviously and and so what i would say is maybe one has some insights one should certainly then use those insights like this bottle and the, and, and, and the and the circle but then try to do your empirical stuff on that maintaining maintaining that structure you, you see i mean I, I kind of feel like there should be a lot of interplay between what i would call sort of synthetic theory on the one hand and you know stochastic kind of uh, experimentation on the other hand both are really important and i think the interplay is something that could be extremely fruitful yes yes i mean i agree that it would be very hard to come up with a cute idea that is well-rounded and it works perfectly and beats everything that people have been tuning for a long time right but the best of all worlds certainly would be uh would be probably the right way to go. So, uh, okay, so we actually don't have any more questions here in the queue and we are four minutes uh, over two. So, uh, so with this, let me uh, thank you again very much, Gunnar, for the very nice talk and conversation.